a couple people on the line here, which is good, waiting for a couple more. Uh, give us about one or two more minutes here. And then I'll be sharing the screen and uh, going over some demos. <clears throat> All right, just about to start preparing one last thing here. Um, got a lot of cool uh, like demos to show you guys today. In particular, uh, there's been there were about three or four conferences I think since the last time we spoke, and I want to uh, cover some of the highlights there and show you how we've incorporated um, a lot of. Um, what has come out of those conferences uh, and work them into the pipeline AI open source and how you can use pipeline to um, work with these um, new advancements and things that were released this the, these last few weeks. So um, in particular, there's been a couple of conferences. Um, there was Amazon reInvent that was at the end of November. All right, just had a couple spare uh, backup alarms here. I've been sick the last couple of days, so I wanted to make sure I did not miss this. Um, yes, yeah, so in particular, there was uh, right, like the Amazon reInvent, and there's also KubeCon. So, um, you know, there was a lot of Kubernetes things that were released, and I want to talk a couple projects uh, that are pretty significant there. Um, and let's see, reInvent this product or this uh, service that uh, like Amazon now offers is called Amazon SageMaker. Um, it's based on ECS, like beneath the covers, you actually upload your own Docker images um, if you would like, and you can use their machine learning uh, serving platform or even training platform. And um, so I'll cover all these here in a bit, but let me just get the final, I think this is it here. Endpoint. Let's see. Yeah, and then I have to create an endpoint. So I'm setting up SageMaker right now. I also have a Kubernetes cluster um, that is ready to go, and we're going to deploy. So how we're going to do this is we're going to use. Uh, See what's going on here. Add model. Um, we're going to use uh, the pipeline AI stuff to actually build the Docker images that are then used uh, either on Kubernetes or within SageMaker or even across the two, which is really exciting. So um, we probably won't get to the hybrid stuff today, but um, that's definitely a lot of research going into Q1 
um, and stabilizing that um, for early next year. Also, the other big thing that's on the roadmap for early next year for pipeline is uh, streaming and uh, in particular online training. So uh, we've we've pretty much nailed down a lot of the um, um, the sort of infrastructure for for Kafka that's all built into the Docker images now, and uh, now all we need to do uh, is get it wired up and get some samples out there, and we'll be good to go. So let me make sure this is starting. SageMaker, SageMaker takes a bit of time. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen so you guys see what I'm doing. Uh, Share screen here. <clears throat> okay. I had to reboot my machine at some point. Uh, this came last night and today. Exit out of here, exit out of here. One other exciting thing, we actually just last night, we froze V1.4. Um, so if we go to, yeah, everything starts a pipeline AI. This is how I even get to things anymore because I can't, I can't remember all the links to everything. So uh, everything starts with pipeline AI. Um, yeah, here, if you would, please star those, uh, that like GitHub repo. Um, We've confirmed with the VCs that they do actually put a dollar value on these things. And, you know, it's somewhere between $1,500 and $2,000 per star. That's how much valuation a company is worth. Uh, so the more stars we have, the better. There's our GitHub down there in the bottom right, uh, if I back up. So there's, there's the GitHub, there's our YouTube channel, there's our slide share, and there's the meetup right there. Um, if we start, uh, if we go to this very first repo, this is where all the action happens here. Um, and if we scroll down, <clears throat> one thing, oh, so actually let's show this here. We've got the releases tab. So we skipped over 1.3. Um, we pulled an iPhone uh, 8 to 10 kind of leap there where we just kind of forgot about um, one release. Uh, that's okay. We're trying to get caught up and sort of track along with the TensorFlow releases, not not necessarily uh, the exact same, but um, was kind of a nice, uh, you know, number to pick. But if we click on that, so we see um, also there's a lot of other projects that come along with uh, this main pipeline that we'll see here in a sec. There's a CLI. Um, so we had just announced SageMaker support one week after SageMaker came out. Um, so that was actually pretty easy for us, SageMaker and Pipeline were very similar in uh, design and uh, almost scarily similar in design, in fact. Um, so we caught wind of this project a few months prior to reInvent. So we knew that they were going to release something similar. We just hadn't seen exactly, we, we weren't sure of the details. So um, I'll, yeah, I'll go through uh, SageMaker here, but first I'll show um, kind of, you know, at the high level, you can create a notebook instance. So if there's anyone out there that uses, uh, you know, something like Databricks or um, Kubel, something like that, where you can create, you know, these notebook instances, um, they're, they're a layer on top of Amazon. And now Amazon has this built in directly, which is really nice. It has the, the um, IAM roles and all that good stuff built into it. You can also create long running training jobs. So these notebooks um, have Conda and have uh, TensorFlow and that kind of stuff installed. Um, and you can explore and then you can get that into a you know long running job or you can bring your existing long running jobs that you have, training jobs, um, even ones that you spark. And uh, so if anyone's using EMR even, um, this is actually like a, a you know, sort of a nice one-click way to um, get, you know, your long-running feature engineering, you know, Spark jobs plus TensorFlow um, in, you know, in, into one single um, common environment. And then there's channels to get your, um, these train models uh, into production and actually create endpoints. And you could do A-B testing. Um, you could set up weights, uh, you know, percentage-based weights uh, for, 
um, these different models and, you know, Canary release, you can put you know, like a brand new version of a model out that's taking 1% traffic, things like that. So that's a lot of what, um, you know, pipeline has for the Kubernetes side. Um, one thing you can do, you know, because we are very big on dynamic weight uh, shifting for these endpoints, you know, so Model C could be doing well um, very early on in an experiment. And, you know, with these more modern, uh, like bandit based, fair, um, uh, fair like model tests, we want to be shifting traffic much more dynamically than, um, you know, setting up a static endpoint configuration and, you know, having so. We are actually working on ways to merge some of our bandit logic with, uh, you know, the ability for us to control the endpoint um, within SageMaker. So the short of it is we'll be able to do the same type of A-B tests um, where like using pipeline either on SageMaker or on Kubernetes. So um, that will also be coming very soon as well, too. Um, we'll also be working in, of course, we'll have Kafka support, also Kinesis support. Um, I'm actually the one that built uh, the Kinesis uh, Spark streaming adapter, you know, back in the day. So I've got a lot of Kinesis experience. We used it heavily at Databricks um, and even a bit at the IBM Spark Tech Center, things like that. So let's see, what else do we have here? Um, oh, and also... Oh, yeah, so SageMaker does support GPUs. I'll show that here in a sec as well, too, on both the training and the serving side. We've also added, um, we've been using, we've been partnering up with some folks recently and found that their Slack channels have been really good support uh, channels for us, you know, for, for our partners. Um, so we actually uh, finally figured out a way to set up a public Slack channel here, a public invite. So go there. Um, we're starting to see a little activity in the general, you know, people uh, just as recent as yesterday actually had um, a bug. And this is something we likely would not have seen uh, if we had asked them to go through the Zendesk channel and the, you know, normal. Um, so we fixed that right away, which is really nice. Everyone seems to be adopting Slack. And uh, so definitely the preferred uh, wait for that here. We've got, um, we'll be redesigning this documentation as well, too. We've been just adding it kind of flat to this whole, um, uh, this, you know, big, huge readme. So we'll be breaking this up. You can see we've already started even putting in, uh, we have a docs folder now, and this stuff isn't all, uh, like, necessarily integrated and, you know, cleaned up, but uh, this is kind of where I've been putting things that we'll be doing today, for example. Uh, so this started off just notes on my local machine and I decided to put them out on here and then eventually they're going to get rolled into the main readme docs. Uh, but yeah, so let's keep going. Um, go back to the main readme. We picked up another uh, couple high profile users too. We haven't integrated them into um, this list here yet, but uh, we'll be announcing that pretty soon. Um, there's quite a few people. The SageMaker channel actually opened up um, quite a, a few new opportunities for us. So, you know, we're, we're definitely not going to take on SageMaker um, head on. Like a lot of folks are starting to find themselves in that situation where we, you know, recognize the power of these cloud vendors and there's no um, there's no reason to you know try to take them um, on directly. So we're definitely going to work with them. One thing for for Windows people, we've noticed if you install PowerShell, um, especially uh, you know people using because um, with Windows Seven you you can't use the new Docker for Mac, um, and so we've been having some weird uh, you know some strange issues with people using the older Docker and with you know. Um, particularly the CLI here uh, expects, and we've done all we can within the CLI to adjust for the backslash and the forward slash, and we've got a bunch of notes where things could fail, but we found PowerShell works really well, and it seems to work in, you know, Windows land too, um, which is what it was designed for anyway. But So if you can't give that a try, if you're still having problems with either Python 2 or Windows, uh, let us know. We, we tend to work with Python 3 on, um, you know, Linux, uh, yeah, we do everything within Docker containers, either on the Mac um, or Linux machines. 
So we added a couple new traffic router things here. Um, so there's traffic route split, yeah, traffic router split, um, which I'm gonna demonstrate today. Uh, this says enterprise, you could actually do this um, with the community or with standalone, but this is one of the things that from a support standpoint, we have to bump you up to a higher uh, support, but you could certainly use it and if, you know, um, yeah, try it out and see, see how you like it. But um, also the streaming stuff, we may be pulling, you know, keeping that out for um, a higher tier just because there is a bit more complexity. Um, and but there's a few more features that that are uh, like available with the streaming um, as a whole. So keep an eye on this. Uh, and definitely, you know, you can at like very minimum, you can at least like tap into it and see see what we're doing and you know try to reproduce it on your own, or you could. Uh, stick with Pipeline AI. Also, we've added a, the ability to test SageMaker um, the same way that we would you know, send traffic to uh, Kubernetes or a local uh, server. We can actually test and point traffic to SageMaker from the, the CLI itself, which is really nice. Um, as usual, you can, you know, server is just a single instance, cluster is a cluster. This is where you start getting into the more complicated support scenarios, which is where uh, the enterprise stuff kicks in, but um, with cluster, you can auto scale. Um, also, we've been beefing up our training. So the ability to train um, both on a cluster. So this is distributed TensorFlow training. And, um, you know, this is with Kubernetes. We will also be supporting SageMaker. Um, we sort of, we, we support it mostly now. There's a couple small things that you have to do by hand. So, you know, we're 99% uh, supporting SageMaker's training. Um, we're just trying to automate a couple more things, um, but you know, essentially, it's building a Docker image that uses the TensorFlow, um, the new experiment API, and uh, right, like the estimator API. And as long as you are using these APIs and following, a, you know, some of these um, opinions that are expected by both the Google Cloud ML engine and by SageMaker um, and by, you know, pipeline on top of uh, like Kubernetes, we're following the exact same standards that are laid out by these guys, uh, then you're in good shape. And you can actually distribute your training and uh, out comes a single uh, model that comes out into the S3 bucket of your choice. All right, so if you follow these instructions, this will actually give you uh, let's see. Let's do one real quick here. Also, if you have questions, I'm keeping an eye on the chat. Throw your your questions in there, and uh, we are recording this. There's really not many slides. I I, I try to keep this a little bit more dynamic um, than you know a typical talk. I do talks all all year long, and it's it's nice to kind of do things a bit free form. So. Um, Assuming that we've followed, oh, and then I should also point out two huge things that we added. We've been, um, we had about two or three people come to us all at the same time and we finally figured out what was going on. Uh, they were building the Docker image behind a firewall proxy to like pip install and things like that. So we, we simplified our build as much as possible to remove as many of those external dependencies, but at the end of the day, because we are so flexible, because we do give you the ability to specify uh, your pipeline conda and um, dot yaml, which you know is very powerful, um, gives you a lot of flexibility in where, um, you know, right, like you could actually specify pip install. Um, so things that are not available on conda can still go into this pipeline conda environment. And just to give you guys some context, let me pull up uh, one of these files here. Actually, I'll just do it. Uh, let's see. And so this is a sample pipeline Conda. You know, we heard over and over people use Conda. They like the flexibility that it offers. Um, what's really cool is you can actually specify a version of pip, a different version of Python, um, and if you have things that can't be installed by Conda, uh, you would then put them here and it triggers pip install. 
So this is really nice. Um, make sure I have the latest here. Yeah, I didn't think I did. Okay. Um, so yeah, because here we have TensorFlow 141. Um, also, pipeline runtime, this is what, what gives you, you know, this is totally open source stuff. This is out on PIP. Um, this gives you some of the, the cool things you can do within um, your train methods and your uh, serving, your like predict, um, or like pipeline module as well too. So let me show uh, the second thing. So now to handle these tricky things with, uh, proxies, you can actually embed them in here. And let's see, it looks like we actually don't have this turned on here. But if you look at, there's this link here. There's a way to actually put in the your proxy servers. So specifically, you would say, you know, proxy servers, something like that. Uh, and here overrides that default pulled from. So you can either do it here, and then also there's a second way now that, that we had just added actually literally uh, a couple days ago was this way here. If we, we've finally just bit the bullet and added this kind of generic um, there's been like enough people asking for custom things to do. So when we're installing your code, we can run any generic um, shell script. And this is a bash script because everything happening within here is um, all Linux, right? So keep in mind, even if you are on Windows and you yourself have set up your proxy, your you know proxy settings, the problem is when you're running inside of the Docker image and that thing doesn't know about the, the proxy settings, right? So you would either have to uh, pass them in through Docker or through some other mechanism, or now you can actually add them into the script. So this will set it up. Um, this actually burns it into uh, the, um, right, like bash RC, so that this will run every time. Actually, it this, physically will, um, it makes a part of the activate.d within your conda um, specific environment. So every time um, that Docker image starts, it, it you know launches into that conda env and then this particular script runs. And you could do anything in here really. Like we've seen people, yeah, obviously set up HTTP proxy. Um, we've also seen people do like apt get uh, you know, ODBC drivers that they're using within their, their training jobs or within, um, you know, their even like prediction jobs. We've seen people actually like load in reference data when they load up their model and um, they're, you know, joining to that, that reference data during prediction time. So um, we were trying to keep this minimum so people don't get too crazy here. It really, you know, it really opens a door for some Harry support, uh, but for right now, it's actually been helping us with support uh, more than it's been causing us problems. So uh, it's kind of a nice thing to have. So keep that in mind. You've got that flexibility. Um, all right, so let's jump back here. We're in the models directory. Uh, let's do a training server build. So literally what's happening is, I open up another terminal here. Um, so we are building census model. We're building and slurping in this directory with this model. Uh, this, this particular model, we're using pipeline underscore train. Anything with pipeline underscore gets treated specially by pipeline and it's kind of, you know, it, we know it, it relates to our framework. Uh, we do, So this is the main uh, pipeline train dot uh, pipeline underscore train dot pi. So this actually is what gets invoked. And the real meat of this here is this experiment API, which works across um, you know Google Cloud and SageMaker. 
and this generate experiment function. And you know, here we see we're we're pulling from some some well known. Um, so there's a bit of black magic that that goes on here. You really have to follow an existing example. Um, you know, we have tons of examples. If you do LL here, we've got uh, Java and Keras, and you know, if you have um, like PMML or anything that supports PMML, um, that's that goes in there. Any raw Python code, if you just want to build a model that uh, just you know maintains some some weights that that you've arbitrarily trained, that's cool. Um, Sidekit, uh, which uses the you know Python runtime, or you could actually use the PMML runtime depending on um, your like performance needs. And we have Spark ML support, and of course TensorFlow, which we're doing right now, and XG Boost. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> All right. Um, so let's run this command here. And oh, I, which I think we already did. So this this should be pretty quick. Um, we're definitely using you know Docker caching and things like that. So what we've done was is we've slurped in your Conda YAML. We've slurped in Conda RC. Um, we've pulled in the model. Also, if you notice at in, inside that directory, um, or so we have uh, this input. We have a the model, and then when we actually run the model, there'll be an output directory. So the input directory, we actually have um, five different uh, data sets here. The most common ones, of course, are training data set, testing data set, and validation data set. But then we also have a predict data set and a tuning um, uh, rally data set. Um, and it's more than just data set, it, it could be, you know, Hyperparameter tuning configuration files. These are heavily influenced by Google Cloud ML Engine, which um, touts hyperparameter tuning as its, um, you know, main main feature add um, and the ability to scale similar to SageMaker. All right, so we just um, here's a couple notes, especially on things like uh, for the proxy. That's exactly the step where where you would see issues if you have a proxy server. Um, so let's just do a Docker PS and kill anything. Uh, uh, okay, I think we're gonna go to port there. So let's run. Let's run this training job. And if you notice, we when we run it, we actually pass it, you know, some um, configs that are needed within the actual. Uh, job itself, and also we can do. Let's look at the training logs. So here we see it, you know, doing its thing. Here, uh, this is a single server now. Like whenever you see server, that means a single Docker image. Um, we can do uh, the multiple ones here in a bit, but I want to show you. First of all, just getting the single image to work, and actually we could do the same. We, we can use that same single image. Um, uh, inside of the distributed training as well too, and that's the beauty of using the Estimator API. And um, fortunately, SageMaker also supports the exact same um, rather Estimator API, and so yeah, everything just kind of works even across um, these more sophisticated uh, rather platform services. So here's you know our plots and things like that directly. This is the you know this is the census model here and you can zoom in and you can see where time is being spent. You can see if we're using CPUs. Uh, yes, everything here is CPU. Um, we can certainly do it on our GPU. We would just, instead of uh, when we built it, instead of saying we would just add in one more, we'd say model chip equals, if it was a TPU, we'd say TPU. If it's GPU, we do GPU and it generates the GPU version. Um, pulls in the NVIDIA stuff and can be pushed out to either Kubernetes running on a GPU, which we have working, um, or SageMaker using GPU. All right, and it changes the color for some reason, so I'm going to get out of there. Start over in a new. Okay, and um, Get rid of all those. Oops. 
branch where I'm at here. So yeah, so there we just trained locally and then watched it and we can keep, you know, we can like rerun it. We have full control over what we're logging. There's actually ways to log your own scalers. So things even outside of the, the training run, which is kind of cool. Um, but uh, yeah, so let me go back. So that was running a, a local tensor um, board inside of the training job. And we'll have the same for the cluster here in a bit. Um, so now we're actually going to switch and use MNIST here. I, I haven't connected these two examples yet, um, just for time's sake, but for right now we'll, um, train. So we've got predict MNIST and it's version one. One thing we could do, we can actually look at, uh, what was created and we could see, we actually have we've added labels here now this helps us with our docker container management we can actually see all the labels on this we can see the base image um, is 1.4 uh, what else it was built for this chip um, oops, I just scrolled, I scrolled out of it um, that's the model name runtime is tf serving this um, so this runtime this is one thing that we're going to be working on actually later today i'm heading down to Santa Clara to meet with the NVIDIA folks and get um, pipeline working with Tensor RT, which is a new runtime by uh, the NVIDIA folks for optimized GPU uh, predictions and, you know, the inference side. And specifically, we, we picked up one new user um, who has, has uh, the, the first real large-scale IoT case that we have found interesting. And, um, that so we're going to be working with them to get uh, their models working and using TensorRT um, on the NVIDIA Jetson. And so you know this is a, a crazy combination of CUDA drivers and and um, you know with TensorRT they're taking your TensorFlow model and they're post processing it and doing some some tricks and um, things to get your model ready uh, for you know five millisecond uh, like latencies and you know things like that. Um, and so this particular IoT case is one of those autonomous delivery services that we find pretty interesting and pretty valuable. Uh, and they have the need to score in you know single digit millisecond. They're basically seeing images and as they see they they need to go around dogs on the street or on the sidewalk. They have to know how to cross, um, how to read the you know numbers on the 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 countdown for when you're crossing the street, things like that. So um, this is a case where they're just, uh, you know, just about to go over the latency needs because they've, they've been adding more and more complex models. And we feel this is a good time to come in and help them and get, uh, you know, Tensor RT deployed and um, those latencies down because we've tested it, you know, offline and has really good results. Um, and now we just have to get it working on the Jetson and, um, see how things go from there. So that'll, that will let them uh, build more complicated models and still continue to do single digit latencies. So we've built that. Um, and now let's run locally. This is stuff we've done before. So nothing real new here, except um, we can, so if we start the logs, let's see this thing starting up and we should be able to make predictions right away you see bad gateway that's okay that's actually a good sign it just it's still still loading just give that a sec um, okay there we go so we passed in uh, this file here is a um, JSON representation of an image and we're passing that in to our local endpoint and now that's and we can actually see the variance that responded this will come in handy when we point to a cluster so let me just do kube CTO and see what we got this is running on our uh, production cluster out here. So we have three different versions that, that we've deployed. Um, and let me just walk through the rest of this single 
stuff here. Predict. Okay, we can actually do a load test for those that haven't seen this. It's kind of cool. We could do a little mini load test locally, just to give us, you know, kind of like a rough idea um, of our, you know, latency on our, you know, single laptop. So as we're testing, we could just compare um, and get kind of a rough idea from model to model what what we're going to deal with. Here's a way to just curl it. We get the same results. Um, if you notice, this variant gives us all the information that we looked up in the label. So we see that this is using TF serving. Um, we're, we're also going to be using Tensor RT. Uh, and I'm sure the next time we speak, we'll have that working for you guys. Uh, the other cool thing is you can actually get more kind of uh, um, like flashier dashboards here. And you can, when you're doing these, these local load tests, like you can actually jump over here and see how things are going. You can see at a high level, what's my 90th percentile, uh, my 99th percentile, things like that. So again, this is local. There's one more level of um, metrics that you could do, which is Grafana, which we have installed in this um, this particular uh, like image. And you could actually look at more lower level things like, uh, you know, how long did it take to transform your, our JSON into a tensor or into NumPy? Uh, how long did the prediction take? And then how long did it take to actually transform the, the, um, that result from NumPy back into JSON? All right, so that's all cool. Um, let's stop this thing locally just so we free up any ports for anything else that's running. Um, let's see. So let's get into the SageMaker stuff. I, yeah, so I want to point this out. So real quick, on the uh, notebook side, when you get into SageMaker, you would create notebook. And this is essentially Databricks. This is what you know, 30 developers uh, built and maintain and all kinds of technical debt um, around this type of thing. So um, and really, there's, there's no reason to be using any service anymore that sits on top of um, right, like Amazon when, you know, for, for machine learning and for Spark and for ETL and that kind of thing when it's already built in here. So there's some other smaller, you know, Y Combinator startups that are struggling that, um, you know, have this, this exact same business model and they've pretty much been blown out of the water um, since this reinvent. So let's see. So we could select our IAM roles. We can select a P2 instance. Um, we can embed this inside of a specific VPC. You know, this is all the stuff Databricks was was building, and you know, they they had a whole team of people that were just using uh, the Amazon API beneath the covers and pulling in and populating these same uh, like dropdowns, um, but in a much less secure manner. Here we can you know tag our notebook. We should always tag things so we can find them later. You would then create the notebook instance, and within a few, um, you know, 30 seconds or so, you actually get a notebook that has this name, um, and it's, you know, dot SageMaker, dot Amazon, you know, dot com kind of thing. So uh, that's pretty cool. And it gives you about 12 different environments, Conda, um, and, you know, you can install anything. You store the notebooks in an S3 bucket. Uh, for future use, um, you know, do all the familiar things. You could also train a model within that notebook, like assuming it fits inside of a P2, um, you know, large or uh, these M4. There's not many instance types that are offered right now for some reason. I'm not exactly sure, but they do have a GPU instance and they do have a pretty, some pretty high memory instances there. Um, but then what you really want to do is for sort of longer running jobs, you want to um, create a training job and this is where the real excitement comes. So if I was going to do train census, which is what we trained earlier, we'd select an IAM role. We can create one right in line. We could use any of Amazon's. Um, this comes from their old kind of Amazon ML service that pretty much nobody used. Uh, but the cool thing is this custom down here. So the second that you click custom, you have full control. You can provide it the coordinates. So somewhere I've got uh, my ECR, my Elastic uh, Container Registry. So this is within Amazon. Um, you would have had to, let's see, where's my repos? Here's Train Census. So at some point, I've uploaded uh, this particular image. And that image 
at the very bottom of my Docker image, um, you know, has has the command to run pipeline underscore train, which is the exact thing that we ran when we, you know, did the local uh, command line version here. So as long as that says, you know, run pipeline underscore train, and we've tested it over here offline, we would then upload the image. We then point to this image. Um, you know, if it's V1, whatever, you know, blah, 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 tag here is. Uh, and here's the cool part. This is where we've access to a whole ton of um, like Amazon instances and specifically, you know, the like ML based ones used for, um, right, that are specific to the machine learning or very useful uh, for like machine learning. So here's a P3. This is, you know, 16 um, Volta uh, V100s, I believe, uh, possibly eight, maybe it's 16 CPUs and then uh, eight of the G of the um, of those V100 GPUs, but yeah, yeah. So you would pick the instance type. Let's pick the most expensive. We'd say we want 24 of these. We want to give 100 gig to each. I'm trying to figure out the highest amount of money I can possibly spend on one job. You could also pass hyperparameters. So this is where um, within your code you can access the values externally. Uh, so you know here you, you can even give it ranges, right? You could say I want to do um, learning rates and the value is going to be a set of 0 0.025, 0 0.025, 0 0.005 to uh, 0.0, .0 um, you know, seven, five, something like that. And, and then within your code, you would access this and you would run your, you know, grid search, like whatever mechanism, um, uh, you want, and you can then train with all of these different hyperparameters or just like literally create separate jobs and say this one, zero point zero zero two five. And then you would have a separate job that's doing another one. And these would all run in parallel. Also, I had mentioned back here that we have different um, let's see, TensorFlow, uh, Census, uh, input. We have different what, um, so this is what like Amazon calls channels of your input. And so you can have multiple channels, like we could have training. So this would be an S3 bucket that ha that points to you know, so this would be something like uh, pipeline AI. Actually, we have a um, one ECS or sorry, um, S3 bucket that data palooza, uh, data palooza, um, and it has all these different things like census input, and it's got basically these same things. It has our all right, so this is training, so this would be the, the training one. We could also use compression. We just tell it what it is. We could give it a particular, so with like MXNet, like they've actually created this new file format called record IO. Um, so that's something to, to take a look at. Um, and yeah, so we could create one for training. We could create one for validation. Give it a different bucket uh, like that and create one for test or something like that. Okay. And that's all that's all you have to do and you would then launch oh and then for the output we'd say, you know, data palooza uh, output um, or the census output. And this is where your model would go and you can even encrypt it and boom create the training that starts up the job with all these with all the nodes that we've specified with that configuration. And as long as your Amazon quota gives you the ability to launch 24 of these P3 16s, which it probably will not, um, by default, you have to ask for that. So but that's how to do that. Now on the serving side, this is the, the demo I have running here. I've uploaded three different Docker images, um, three different versions, A, B, and C. And uh, I've created a, configuration endpoint. So the way that Amazon speaks here is you first upload the models, then you create this endpoint. And an endpoint configuration is where you actually would tell it which models and like the initial weight. So they're they're all given, you know, 100% weight right now. 
Um, you could also scale them differently. And um, uh, yeah, so here we've got variant, we have three different variants, variant one, variant two, variant three. Um, you could actually override those variant names, which I didn't do here for some reason, but um, so this is, that's an endpoint configuration, which you then ultimately tie to an endpoint. And the endpoint here is called predict-mnist, and it's in service. And so let's try to run it. Let's see, there should be uh, test-stage, or sage. OK. So we should, from the command line, um, and I have to fill in the endpoint name which is predict mnist and I've given it the same JSON from before and I'm telling it to do this um, 100 times in parallel. So like a little mini load test against SageMaker. So there we go. And there's our variants, um, both the, the name that we configured in SageMaker, um, which is, is different than the one that is internally uh, being represented. This is to, you know, so that no matter where you're at, no matter what you name this, this particular variant tells you exactly what's inside of this model. If this was a GPU, uh, if it was CPU. So you see it's it's spraying them evenly across A, B, and C. So that's nice. Um, we could adjust those. And that's the part. There's uh, a BOTO, which is the Python um, SDK essentially for uh, the Amazon CLI. BOTO, um, you can actually create new versions of the endpoint configuration with different weights and then apply them. Um, and that's very similar to what we what we do with uh, Kubernetes as well too. So let me go back here and I'm gonna flip over to the cluster. Sorry for the crazy scrolling. Let me go to docs here. I'm gonna cluster specifically the predict side. So we've already, um, uh, what, what are the versions there, kubectl? I think we have A, B, and C. Oh no, we have V1, V2, V3, okay. So I'm gonna have to, so here is just that same predict build that we did before. Um, and, but let me change the version here. So I'm clear this and I'm going to, if, if I had not already built it, um, this might take a bit, uh, a minute, but we've already built it. So this should happen pretty quickly. Um, okay, so we've got V1 there. Let's run it again. Um, so all we're doing is just making sure that we've built it. This is just to kind of like remind us of how we would get something from local that we've tested uh, that we would run a local load test to something um, out onto Kubernetes or out onto SageMaker. Um, here, I'm, I'm, I, I just showed uh, SageMaker and I configured it manually um, because we haven't yet integrated in all the CLIs for SageMaker to um, do it from the command line, but uh, that's coming very soon, obviously. A uh, lot of interest from our users to get uh, our stuff integrated into um, SageMaker and it's exactly what we're spending time doing, which is why we were just one week after the announcement, we were um, uh, like pretty much fully compatible, to just uh, you know minor few use cases that we can't do from the command line yet. Uh, okay, so we just pushed version, I keep having to change the versions here, um, let me do clear. Let's push version two and make sure that's out. So this is actually going to Docker Hub, which is where Kubernetes is pulling from, but you could use your own private repo um, as long as you have everything set up properly. 
the secrets, which is all documented here. Uh, V3, boom. So we're pushing and getting that out there. That's now this is available to the cluster. So the next step here is um, let's get uh, clear. So now we're saying, um, let me do one thing, get, let me clear out the existing deploys. Deploy. I was testing this last night, V1. And we have about 10 minutes left, so show me, um, or put any questions in the chat that you'd like answered, or post them to the um, Slack afterward, and we will get to them uh, as we see them. Okay, so I've removed that also. Um, so now there should be no models running out there, none. So now we're actually gonna run um, the next pipeline, so this is a, a cluster command, cluster start, and let's get V1 going. So it's doing a lot of stuff here. We actually like relied pretty heavily on this project called Istio, I-S-T-I-O. Um, if you haven't seen it, this gives us the ability to do the dynamic routing and uh, circuit breakers and you know all the resilience and service mesh and all that good stuff. So uh, we so we started. Um, version one, now let's get version two going. Now let's get version three going. So now all three versions are out there running and I, you know, I actually just for like debugging purposes show what we're physically running and you can actually take a peek. There's these dot pipeline files that have been created. We'll, you know, likely clean these up, um, uh, you know, as we get more and more people using this and um, our like debugging, um, needs to go down, but let's look at one other thing. So check this out. This is the router splitting. So we've got versions V1, V2, V3. Um, and so we got V1, V2. So this is doing some Istio configuration behind the scenes, which gets applied to our Kubernetes cluster and to our service mesh. And we'll put 34% going to version one uh, and 33 and 33. Let's say we actually screw this up and just put 33, 33, 33. Uh, we get an error saying 99 uh, does not equal 100. That's my favorite part of this code. All right, so clear that. Let's run it with the proper 100%. And we've configured all the rules and um, everything looks good. So here we've got V1 is 34. I can show you guys this file actually. So this is all it is, is we're scripting it. It's you know generating this breakdown. Um, all of this stuff has to all work together. So you have to be very careful. Um, th these are kind of tricky to like reverse engineer even from the samples provided by the Istio folks. So now I should be able to, um, oh, and then I could scale any particular tag, I, I can give it more replicas. The cool thing about that is if I increase the number of like replicas on a particular version, um, with like Istio, it, it will still route properly. So even though there's 10 more versions of version three, it, it will still only send 33% to version three, no matter how many replicas. So that's a huge difference. Um, I don't think SageMaker does that. Um, I actually haven't tested it, <coughs> but my guess is um, it is not going to support that type of complexity. Um, okay, so let's run. So, we need to get the endpoint as part of the SDO stuff. You can actually have a single load balancer that can now handle many different um you know types of traffic right so just based on prefix coming in so if you have you know slash v1 slash v2 slash v3 things like that you don't need three separate load balancers um ingress is something you will learn quite a bit about when you read about istio um, it's actually a layer that sits on top of um your services in fact i just released uh 
slide share here um, on Istio. Yeah, right here. Uh, let me paste this into the chat. Um, about Istio and you know how it works and how we're taking advantage of it. So what we're going to do now is run the exact same, um, not against SageMaker, but in, and not against our local server, but we're going to run it um, on our ingress, our single endpoint. This is, okay, so let's give it that. Oops. That's a slide share. Grab this. Grab that endpoint. Okay, so everything stays the same. It's still an HTTP request, except instead of localhost, we're actually going to point it to. Uh, this ingress, which you can, you know, create like a route 53 or, you know, nice pretty DNS name uh, called predict MNIST, you know, dot pipeline, dot AI, something like that. Uh, so let's hit this. And this is actually hitting our cluster. And we're running it a bunch of times. And we see, we should be seeing a pretty good mix of V1, V2, V3. And we do. And that's because of the, the, um, that like Istio routing. And now, Let's actually change it. So dynamically, we can run one command to change this split to be, so let's say model C ends up being a clear winner in our experiment. And so, you know, th this is all going to be done through like a nice UI and, you know, that's kind of the very last thing before we um, become a full product here. Right now we're, you know, very command line just to hit a lot of cases and not get bogged down by UI specific things and um, just make sure we're even adding value. So here from the command line, we are updating the weights for this experiment. And we're saying we want 97% to go to V3, 2% to go to V1, 1%. So um, let's clear that. And now we should rerun. And we should see model C to getting most of, or sorry, uh, V3 getting most of the traffic. And that's exactly what we're seeing. V3 is soaking up a lot of the traffic, and occasionally we blip and see a, a two or a one. And um, and eventually we could even, uh, if we want, let's just completely get rid of um, zero or uh, yeah, version one and then version two, and just give 100% to V3. And then we should never actually see anything else get any traffic except V3. There should be no blipping. Yep. So there we go. One command, we could shift traffic magically. Um, you know, again, we'll be building this uh, same functionality for SageMaker. It's just a couple API calls away. Um, we didn't get it in time for today. But uh, yeah, so that's that. Um, any other questions here? I don't want to keep people too long. Check out Istio. Uh, oh, one cool thing too. Um, let me actually pull up the Istio docs. And I want to show you guys some of the uh, metrics gathering. You could do distributed tracing. This one's really cool. Oops. Ah. Uh, okay. Istio's up to version 0 0.4, by the way. They had a brief moment. It was at 0 0.3. Uh, then they quickly bumped it up to 0 0.4. So there's this thing called a um, service graph generator, which sounds kind of silly, but let's take a look at what it does. So here we're creating um, just a local port mapping into our, um, you know, poking a hole into our Kubernetes cluster to see. Um, it's just a proxy, so forwarding from localhost. Uh, oh, like we have to run uh, Prometheus and hang on here. Uh, 
Okay. And then we also have to run, I don't think we have to run Grafana, but let's run it anyway. Okay, and then let's go back and run that same thing here. So the service graph thing actually shows us uh, where traffic is going. So if I run this again, and you know, again, we've got everything going to three, so if I hit refresh here, we'll see 100% of the traffic uh, is going to three, um, which is kind of cool. And you know, again, if we change the split and go 33, uh, 34, 33, 33, and then rerun this, we should see traffic balancing um, here in a sec. There we go. So now it's starting to equalize and become even across all three. Okay. Yeah, as more and more data gets sent over. Um, so that's pretty cool. And then also you could do, uh, we can look at Grafana, which has been pre-configured, so you don't have to go through a whole lot of configuration for uh, the Istio stuff. So as traffic is coming in, we could say we want uh, destination, we just want to highlight you know, version one, two, or three. Here, we'll do all of them. Um, and so let's see, yeah. So here we could actually see the traffic um, being split across all three. And if there's errors, we could see where which errors, you know, 502s, 400s, blah, 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 like that kind of thing. So that, yeah, so that's really cool. There's a lot of metrics there. Um, and of course, we have the usual, um, you know, within a, a like prediction, we have a breakdown of three different logical steps. Um, so we look at TensorFlow, MNIST, model, uh, pipeline, underscore predict. This is the hook for the predict method. We're actually pumping out metrics here uh, to like Prometheus, but we also have Datadog. We're finishing up the CloudWatch integration for SageMaker and for like Amazon, uh, but the, the number one that we're asked is for like Datadog right now. Uh, but here we can break down a prediction into three separate uh, sections, which is transform request, predict, and transform response. So that's kind of cool. So we can see where time is being spent. So then you just plug in your code and uh, it will automatically pick all that up. So that's the latest. We're at 10.02, double check questions. Okay, there's nothing here. Um, I'll be posting this here in about 10, 15 minutes. And hit us up on Slack or uh, Zendesk or GitHub issues if you need anything. Thank you so much. Bye.